Hello friends and welcome to Forest Hill Studio. My name is Terry Peters and uh, today I'd like to talk to you about the uh, console rear panel connections for the solid state logic origin and the patch bays you're going to need and the cables that are going to be required to get all of those things hooked up so that you can get full utilization out of the console. Um, I have serial number 139 pretty early in the game um, and I have also the first uh, installation in Maryland, its first origin that was delivered here in Maryland. Um, so if you are interested in seeing how this works and how everything's going to come together, I would encourage you to contact me, come down to the studio and see if origin is right for you. You really won't know until you sit in front of it, listen to it, hear it and understand what it's all about and see if it's going to work with your workflow. So with that in mind, not a lot of content out there yet for uh, the origin. So I thought I'd go through some of the basic stuff in this video and ones to follow that lay out some of the things you know to help you get started, help you plan, help you understand the costs. And then after that, we'll dig a little deeper into each of the installation and exactly how the console works. So with that, let's get started. So one of the first things, um, that I've been receiving in the questions that I get. Um, obviously, the console is expensive for the home or uh, intermediate studio at $50,000, uh, but also there are other costs that you need to consider, and primarily that's because the Origin console utilizes D-subminiature connectors for all of the back panel connections, with the exception of the mic inputs, and then the patch bays that you're going to utilize also use D sub miniature connectors. Um, I'll talk to you about the pricing of that. Um, I guess the best thing I can do is tell you here we are, it's September of 2021, and the prices that I've paid uh, within the past 30 days. So um, it's important to consider these costs because if you're buying this console, you want to wrap that up and bundle it into the cost of the console to maximize any discounts you can get and also to get the financing in order to um, make it as successful as possible so you're not constantly going back into pocket a couple hundred dollars at a time because there's something you forgot. So right off the bat, the console has 46 D sub miniature cables on the back. Um, currently, I bought uh, the Jumpers brand at Sweetwater, and those are on average $200 a piece. That's a good planning number. Also, um, I utilized SSL's recommended patch bay layout, which involves six Switchcraft 96 point TT or Bantam patch bays. Those are going for about $1,000 a piece at Sweetwater right now. Uh, so, all told, there, um, we got about $15,200 just in cabling from the console to the patch bays. What does that get me? That gets you access to every single element and signal path on the console brought out to a patch bay, which can be readily routed to your outboard gear. That gets you channel inserts on every long and short fader input for each channel, the entire master section, and all of your monitor outputs. So a um, couple other things to think of at this point, this obviously pretty large cable order. Um, you can expect to realize a 15 or 20 percent discount buying cables of this quantity and this cost. You need to ask for it. They're not going to give it to you just off the bingo. Uh, but do that. And I think that uh, you'll find that uh, with an order of this size, they're pretty receptive to that. Going on beyond this, there'll be a few things like, for example, patch cords that you're going to need to utilize in the patch bays and a few specialty cables that are not D sub miniature to D sub miniature. You might need D sub miniature to XLR male or female or tip ring sleeve to get to your outboard gear in your equipment racks. In my studio situation, um, the additional cables there cost me about $2,000 and you should plan on those costs. Okay. Before we get started and get into the planning and stuff, a few other things um, that's important to know, things that um, I learned along the way that will be helpful to you. Um, these sub-miniature cables come in quite a variety of quality. Your lower cost, Diadario, other ones like this, uh, maybe even the Waves um, 
Disa miniature cables. They're going to have large plastic back shells and small short jack screws. Jack screws are two little screws on each side of the cable that engage with the mating connector both on the console and on the patch bay. These lower quality cables with large black plastic back shells will not allow the cables to fit into the console and into the patch bay based on how close the mating connectors in the console and the patch bay are. Uh, you need to buy high quality cables that have thin metal back shells with extended length jack screws. This is going to help you Number one, be able to engage them adequately and properly. It's going to give you the room you need to get them plugged in without too much of a headache. And the extended length jack screws are going to allow you to tighten them up and have successful mating connections uh, without any trouble. One thing here regarding the jack screws. As you can see, jack screws have a tiny little threaded area on them. It is super important that you only finger tighten these connectors. I don't mean hand tight, I mean finger tight. Trust me, you'll thank me later. What happens if you use a tool or a screwdriver and you over torque it and you break one of those off? Well, the only way to fix that situation, because now that screw is stuck in the mating connector, is to take that connector either out of your nice new console or out of your patch bay, take it apart, desolder it, replace it, or figure out how to get that broken off thread out of it and start again. Trust me, you don't want to do this. So again, uh, finger tight only. Uh, you've been warned. One thing also that will be helpful is those jack screws are slotted. You can use a little thin screwdriver because it's going to get really tight, as you can see. Um, but again, finger tight only. Don't wrench down on these. Don't use pliers. Don't use anything of this nature. So don't say I didn't warn you. Okay, moving on to more things to know. Um, <laughs> it's a lot, folks, but trust me, um, you need to think about all of these things. It really will make your installation professional and assure that you don't have any problems down the road. So let me start with the cables themselves. Eight channel D sub to D sub cables are heavy. If you do not support these, you will break off the jack screws or break the connectors in the console and in the patch bays. Uh, and trust me, if you break those off, you will be sad. Um, the cable bundle that you see in the pictures here, and you can see, you know, obviously what not to do where they're not tied together. And the other photos, you can see how I've tied those together using pretty substantial tie wraps, as big as my finger in thickness, wrapped around them and connected those to the cable tray that is integrated on the back of the console. The 46 cables that come off the back of my console weigh about 230 pounds. So remember that little jack screw that we saw in the previous picture? Okay, that's the only thing holding the cable in if you don't find a way to support them and do that properly. That weight's going to either stress the cable and break it, or very much more likely, stress the connectors themselves and break them. So you want to support those adequately and make sure that you don't make any mistakes in that area of just leaving things dangling. And when you do tie wrap and support them, make sure you leave a little extra a little extra space in there uh, so that you're not tugging on the connector itself when you tie them all down. Okay, so finally, now we get down to talking about the actual connections. In the graphic that you see here, um, you see the master section that's in red, um, four of the eight channel buckets of the channel input and output sections. And then you can see here how they flow into the recommended patch bays from Solid State Logic. Um, the cables that you see on the back of the console are color coded to the sections of the patch bay. So this will be helpful to start getting your arms around um, what's going to be required and exactly what things are going to plug into where and what th what signals you're bringing out to the patch bays for use when you're doing tracking, recording, mixing, and so on. Obviously, again, to restate the obvious, Origin offers access to all signal paths through these D-sub connectors. And uh, the layout that I'm going to show you and the strategy that I'm going to show you is um, heavily informed by SSL's recommended setup 
uh, for the console and patch bays. Obviously, in your studio, you're going to have to decide based on your workflow whether you need all these connections. And if you don't, there'll be considerable savings both in time and cost and utilizing only what you need. Um, as you can see here, you see the patch bays, you see the back of the Switchcraft um, 96 point patch bays, and you see the SSL recommended patch bay layout. In the sections that follow, I'm going to give you a bit of a strategy for how you can plan ahead before you start doing this, before you start pulling out your wallet and buying cables and patch bays. Um, we really need a strategy from which we can decide what makes sense. And the only way to do that folks as boring as it sounds and not very uh, creative in the music making fashion you have to take a systems engineering approach in the next slides i'm going to talk to you about exactly how you can do that how to make sense of it all so let's get started let's try to plan one of the things that you need to think about before you set up your patch base and the console is your recording inputs some of us have a separate live room some of us don't, but at any rate, your recording sources need to get to the console. The strategy that I've chosen to use there is to use um, basically uh, live feed cable snakes with a connector box on one end, and as you can see, um, XLR and line inputs on the other. I've chosen to run those to a separate group of patch bays, 32 XLR inputs for the mics, and 48 inputs for the line inputs. Uh, those aren't shown on the Switchcraft uh, patch bay layout that SSL provides, but you can see here why that kind of makes sense and the advantage of doing so. Those are all, of course, hardwired to the mic and line ties that actually do, in fact, feed the console. So in this slide, you can see uh, kind of what you're up against. Another important factor here is that you can see the difference between TRS which is the large connector shown here, and the TT or Bantam connections that um, are used in the patch bays. Uh, don't make the mistake, the little TT and uh, Bantam connector is not your mini 8th inch phone jack. It's actually a smaller connector, a little bit smaller than the quarter inch jack that you see here. Uh, so just bear that in mind that you do in fact have to have some special cables when you get to this stage as well. So I've hit you guys with a lot. <laughs> At this point, you may be feeling overwhelmed thinking, what the hell, what am I going to do? Well, the way out of that is to do some planning. Planning is going to make sure that you don't do anything foolish, that you don't make any mistakes, that you don't get halfway through and you have to start again because you realize there was something you wanted to do that you had not considered. So I would urge you to begin by asking yourself a group of questions. Questions like, am I going to be mixing only uh, with the origin, or do I want to do full mixing, tracking, and etc.? cetera? Uh, how many inputs do I need? Do I want to be able to be, use both the long and the short faders on the console simultaneously? Do I want to use the channel inserts on every channel to be able to have an effects path on every channel, or do I just need those on the groups? Um, how do I want to use Q-mixes? Uh, Origin only offers two Q-mixes available to you to send out to your performers. In my case, I'm using a Behringer P16 personal monitoring system where I bring 16 channels out and distribute those down to the performers and we can create their own mix there. That's one way around it. However, two Q-mixes is probably adequate for most of what you're going to be doing unless you're tracking large groups or full bands all at once. If so, you're going to have to figure out which way you want to go. Um, other considerations, um, how many outboard devices do I need to connect to? How many pieces of outboard gear do you have? Um, how many studio monitors do I need to connect? How far away is the console going to be from my equipment rack over there? Um, that's going to really, really be helpful information when you get down to deciding what cables to buy because you'll know the right length. Uh, will I be working hybrid or going full analog? Uh, am I recording to the DAW? Or am I going to use a tape machine? Or am I going to do both? How many recording interface uh, points do I need? You know, how many I.O. channels on my interface? You're going to know those answers by the time we get through the next section of doing the planning and sorting all this out. 
But these are the kind of questions that I can't necessarily answer for you. You have to answer those on your own and think about them. And when you do, it's going to begin to inform the process of selecting the right equipment you need to get it all hooked up and working together. So here we are again, figuring it all out. I will strongly encourage all of you, whether you do it with pencil or paper, or whether you do it on a cool electronic document like you see here, you need a layout of your studio equipment showing how it all gets connected, each and every piece, and the ins and outs of each of those pieces of equipment. Once you have that laid out on a big chart, most of the fat lines that you see going between pieces of equipment are going to represent the D sub cables required to make those appropriate connections. Um, at a minimum, your uh, equipment layout should show what equipment you have, where it interfaces to, the ins and outs of your recording chain, and your outboard effects. Again, each of the bold lines that hooks all of those things together in your system diagram, your studio diagram, those are the things that you're going to need cables for. Um, one tip, if you do decide to go making an electronic document that looks like this, that has the entire layout of your studio on it, I would encourage you to embed the user manual for each piece of equipment right by the little piece of equipment picture that you put in your chart. In that way, you can always open up your studio diagram, see how things are connected. You're not sure what's going on? Click on the manual, boom, it opens up right there. You don't have to go searching for it. So hopefully that's a tip that will be helpful to you too. Now the real fun begins. Now that you understand how Origin connects and the cable types you're going to need, now that you have a handle on the studio gear that you have, now that you know how it all needs to connect together, we need a clear and concise way to make sure that we buy the right cables and we connect them to the right places after they show up. Again, the best way to do that that I have found is with an Excel spreadsheet. Um, luckily for you, for Origin, you'll find a link below in this slide that is a pre-made Excel spreadsheet that I have made that I'm happy to share with you. You can click on the link that shows every in and out connection for Origin, the cable type, and where it needs to go based on the solid state logic uh, recommended connection scheme. Uh, in there, you can then select what cable length is right for you and pick the appropriate ones. By the time you're at the top to the bottom of the list, you have a full listing of all the cable types you need, how long they need to be, and where they're going to connect. So let's take a look at the next slide, and I'll walk you through doing it just for one piece of this, and then I think you'll have it after that. Okay, so now we're down to using that cool Excel spreadsheet that I gave you a link to. If you've opened that up, you'll see here in this slide that kind of relates to, okay, there's that big red square over on the table that shows every, everything connected in the spreadsheet. And that goes down and it tells you, okay, these are the mic tie line inputs. It's going to show you that, okay, that's an XLR to DB25 connector. You're going to decide what length is right. You're going to see in the table that it connects from the console to the patch bay and the connector name on the patch bay that you're going to be plugging that cable into. As you can see here, the little blue squares flow up to the each section in the yellow box, the console, the front of the patch bay, the rear panel patch bay connector. Also, you'll see here the cable type. It's D sub miniature to XLR mouse. This was helpful to you. What you will do is you'll go through this for each box that your planning and your workflow said I need a cable for. Once you do that, you've got a total list of what to buy and where it connects. So now you've figured it all out. You're ready to make the connections. You've spent your money. Your cables just showed up in a box from somebody and wow, it's a lot of them. Um, but in this slide, we show you the physical connections based on the spreadsheet table one mic inputs, which are the console XLR mic inputs. And those go to the patch bay. Patch bay one goes to there's rear connectors. As you can see here, we've shown, okay, there's the first cable. You can see that it connects down to the 
first eight mic line inputs goes over to the patch bay output one through eight. Um, again, I mentioned this before, but it's important uh, and it is noteworthy. You know, solid state logic makes great manuals. They're very comprehensive and they're very complete. You can download those from for free from the SSL website. I suggest that you do that. Take your time, store them on your computer, and refer to them often. They write really excellent manuals, and it's worth it for you to take a moment and give them a read through to get the full potential out of your Origin console. All right, so now that we're down to making the connections and we've made our plan and we know where they're going to go and we've bought the right ones and we're ready to go. A few helpful tips while you're making the connections and one important thing to consider. Number one, there's probably going to be a mistake or two before it's over. You're probably going to change your mind on one or two things before it's over. And this is natural. It's a journey. You need to understand that your studio is in a bit of a point of evolution right now, but you're very, very close to having things exactly the way you want. As you hook them up and begin to use the console, you're going to find out exactly if something needs to change. But let's hope that those are just a couple things to change instead of the entire scheme. If you've planned well, it will be that way. So, making the connections, some helpful tips. When you're populating the console and the patch bays, start from the bottom and work your way up with the connections, as shown here. Uh, this is really going to help you be able to read the labels and be, help you be able to reach the jack screws. If you start doing this and you have them all over the place, you're going to be in a real bind by the time they're always by the time they're all populated. As you can see in the picture, it starts getting real tight real quick. Second tip is uh, one that you'll thank me for later. Take the time to label both ends of the D sub connectors with where they go from and where they go to. This is going to be a huge time saver when troubleshooting time comes, and trust me, sooner or later, troubleshooting time comes. Okay, finally, are you guys overwhelmed yet? <laughs> Seriously, some final thoughts and a couple things if this really does seem like it's all too much for you. Um, again, I would suggest visiting either my studio, anyone who's close enough is welcome to come, sit in front of the console, listen to Origin, see if it's the sound that you're looking for, see if it's the workflow that you're looking for. Seeing it and hearing it is the only way you're really going to be able to decide for yourself. And folks, a YouTube video isn't going to tell you what this thing sounds like. And an hour or two tutorial is going to give you insight to how it works. But until you're sitting in front of it, you really just won't know. Uh, again, feel free to contact me if I can help you guys in any way with any questions that you may have. You can see my contact information below. Uh, further to that, if you don't want to do it yourself and it's all a little too overwhelming, uh, Forest Hill Studio offers some planning and procurement for the things that you're going to need. Occasionally, if it's local, we'll help with installation services. Um, you can give me a call, contact me, whatever you want, if, if that's helpful to you. Finally, take your time and work accurately. This is a big, messy process that I've just described, but it's one that's worth doing, and it's going to save you a lot of time and money down the road, um, especially, especially if you're deciding to do everything yourself. It's important to work slowly, accurately, carefully. When you get tired, when you've had enough today, come back to it tomorrow with fresh eyes. Uh, second thing, enlist some help. Trust me. You're going to be getting up and down off the floor a whole lot of times plugging in 70 or so cables and making sure they're going to the right spot. Having another person who can hand you that cable, tell you here's where it goes from, there's where it goes to, really going to help you. And also, <laughs> it's also going to save your knees and it's going to save your back. So again, uh, you see my contact information there. If you have any questions, thank you guys for watching. If you found this content interesting, uh, please subscribe, uh, like the video. And again, we're going to be putting up a lot more content on the things that we've learned along the way in getting uh, the SSL origin set up and uh, some of the things that are particular to its use during recording and mixing. So with that, I'll bid you guys farewell and we'll see you next time.
Thanks for watching.